This is it. This is so cool. History for kids. We are going to learn some fascinating things about the past. And we're going to start off with this. Ancient Rome. Let's start here. Rome is a city that is in Italy. Here is the flag of Italy, the Italian flag. You can see where Rome is on the map of Italy. You can visit Rome today. It's an amazing place. One of the things that make it so amazing is the rich history of the city. See, Rome was formed in the 8th century BC. That was a long time ago, really, really long time ago. Rome is a very old city. According to legend, Rome was founded by a guy named Romulus in 753 BC. As you might have guessed, Rome got its name from Romulus. That's a cool name. You don't hear that very often, Romulus. You know. Here's the thing, though. Many historians believe there were numerous farm communities in the Seven Hills near Rome and that they joined together to form the city. Wait, that means there may have never been a Romulus. Here is a coin with Romulus and his brother Remus. His brother might be pretend too. <laughs> pretend people, possibly. Possibly. If Romulus was real though, he must have been a really smart guy. Because the location of Rome was perfect. First, Rome was right along the Tiber River. Now, why would that be important? Well, the Tiber River meant Rome had access to water, and water made life and civilization possible. You could see where the Tiber River is and where Rome is on this map. Here is a picture of the Tiber River today. Without the Tiber River, the small city of Rome would have never grown into a massive civilization. Thanks, Tiber River. No, no, really. Thank you, Tiber. Can I, can I call you Tiber? The second reason Rome's location is perfect is that there are huge mountain ranges that protect Rome. The Alps and the Apennines would later make invasions of Rome more difficult. Not only that, Rome is surrounded by hills as well. Rome is protected by natural barriers. In the early days of the city of Rome, Rome was ruled by a king. Sometimes the king would be a jerk, and people would be like, well, he's king, so we just have to live with this. But in 509 BC, they were sick of it. At that time, they had a king named Tarquin the Proud, and you can see him on this coin. Tarquin the Proud. He was an awful king. He killed a lot of people, made everyone miserable, and was very arrogant. That's how he got the nickname the Proud, Tarquin the Proud. Gotta say this, though. If this coin is accurate, while he was a terrible king, he did have good hair. That's a pretty cool hairstyle, isn't it? Uh, you know. Well, the people kicked him out, and they decided to set up a completely different type of government. They made Rome into a republic. You know you did a bad job as king when the place you ruled over just completely changes the government and kicks you out, okay? That's what they did, though. They kicked him out, they said, you're out of here, and they said, we are going to start a republic. This is going to be a republic. What a huge change that was. Now, instead of a king making all of the decisions and being in charge, the people would elect people who would serve in the government for a certain amount of time. Instead of following a king's orders, the people were able to do whatever they wanted as long as it didn't break the law. If that sounds like the government of the United States, that's right. The United States is a republic. Many other countries around the world are republics too. Ancient Rome was way ahead of the curve. Rome was one of the first republics in history, and under this new form of government, Rome thrived. Rome stayed a republic until 27 AD. Let's fast forward hundreds of years to meet this guy. His name is Julius Caesar. 
Julius Caesar is one of the most famous people in Roman history. He lived from 100 BC to 44 BC and had a huge impact on ancient Rome. Julius Caesar was a great general and was also an important writer, writing histories of many of the battles he fought in. He was a hero in Rome and was loved by the people. Boy, was Julius Caesar popular. People heard of all of his victories in battle and knew that his soldiers had absolute loyalty to him. It also helped that he wrote about the battles. He did a good job of always making himself sound like the hero. Well, this shouldn't be surprising, but the Senate was afraid of his power and popularity. Julius Caesar was a big deal. Soon, a civil war broke out. Julius Caesar was victorious and returned to Rome as the ruler of the Republic. For five years, he was the ruler of the Roman Republic before he was betrayed and killed in Rome. But ancient Rome had changed forever. After Julius Caesar was killed, another civil war broke out. Well, guess what happened next? Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, eventually took over Rome and finally brought peace. He was renamed Augustus and became the first emperor of Rome. Augustus was an effective emperor and ushered in a period called Pax Romana, where the majority of people in the Roman Empire lived their lives without fear of invasion. Pax Romana means Roman peace. After Augustus, Rome was ruled by an emperor named Tiberius, the stepson of Augustus. Wow, all these guys are related. The Republic was over and a new period called the Imperial Period began. Wow, ancient Rome went through massive changes through the centuries. Now we are going to talk about the legacy of this fascinating civilization. Like the size of ancient Rome. At its peak, see how huge ancient Rome was. Wow, the Roman Empire is colored purple. That's big. <laughs> That's big. Ancient Rome left a big impact with architecture, with many of their structures still surviving and standing today. Probably the most famous example is the Colosseum. The Colosseum was a massive amphitheater in the city of Rome that still amazes people today. Over 60,000 people could watch sports and events in the Colosseum. Just like us, ancient Romans enjoyed sports and entertainment. In ancient Rome, watching chariot races and fighting were very common. The fighting, though, would be very violent. Unfortunately, many people lost their lives in the Colosseum. And to us, that type of fighting doesn't even sound like a game, but in ancient Rome, people filled the Colosseum to watch fighters called gladiators fight it out. This is cool. Ancient Rome is also known for having water systems and aqueducts bring fresh water to different places. Ancient Rome also had sewers to dispose of waste. Very important. These advancements helped many people live a better quality of life. Ancient Rome also invented socks. Seriously, <laughs> seriously, okay? Next time you wear socks, just think, wow, thank you, ancient Rome. These are really cool. How sad would life be if we didn't have socks? You know, and that's from ancient Rome. 
Even roads. Ancient Rome developed roads that connected the empire. Ancient Romans invented concrete and made stable, reliable roads that made transportation and communication so much easier. Many of the roads in Europe still follow the same path as the ancient Roman roads. Wow, are we are we coming to the end? <laughs> no crying. Whew. Whew. The final impact we want to talk about from ancient Rome is their language. Ancient Romans spoke Latin, a language still used when scientists name plants and animals. And a handful of languages we use today come from Latin. Ancient Rome was one of the most powerful civilizations in all of history, so of course their language would still impact us today. Okay, that was fun. Now we are going to learn about ancient Greece. You see, ancient Greece was a powerful civilization that ruled much of the Mediterranean region, and at times even beyond the Mediterranean region, ancient Greece was so powerful. It is so important to learn about ancient Greece because they impacted us so much. Even though they ruled the Mediterranean several thousand years ago, what's really cool is they impacted so many aspects of our lives. Even sports, math, art, philosophy, the way we do government, the way we do science, that all goes back to the ancient Greeks. Now you might be wondering, where in the world was ancient Greece? Well, we're going to show you on a world map so that you know exactly where in the world we're talking about. Here is the area in the world where ancient Greece was, in a region called the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is actually the name of a sea, and the area of the sea where ancient Greece was, was called the Mediterranean Basin. Actually, it's still called the Mediterranean Basin. And in fact, ancient Greece, the place where that is, that's where modern day Greece is. And here is the flag of the country of Greece. Now, this is kind of cool. Many historians put the story of ancient Greece into three time periods, into three time periods. The first time period is the Archaic period. The second is the Classical period, and the third is the Hellenistic period. These are the three time periods of ancient Greece. Wow, isn't that cool? Archaic period, Classical period, and the Hellenistic period. Okay, so the Archaic period is the earliest period of ancient Greece, and that's when ancient Greece really started taking its form and its organization. This period ended with the introduction of the government structure called democracy. Wait, democracy? What is democracy? What does that word mean? We said that the Archaic period ended once democracy was introduced, but what is democracy? Well, a democracy is a government led by the people, either directly or indirectly through elected officials. It is used all over the world today. In fact, 123 countries in the world use democracy as their form of government, and it was born in ancient Greece. Democracy was born right here in the city-state called Athens. Different city-states in Greece had different forms of government, but Athens had a democracy. So then came the classical period, the days of ancient Greece that most of us think of. We usually think of the classical period. That was when the city-states of Athens and Sparta were at their strongest. 
In Athens, the arts and philosophy were so important. In fact, Socrates and Plato were from Athens and lived in Athens. Athens was a place thriving with culture, the arts, and philosophy. In Sparta, fighting was important. Literally, fighting. They studied war and fighting. They trained the young men when they were boys. Sparta was all about fighting. Sometimes these two city-states would get along and would work together and would even fight together against foreign invaders, but there were so many differences between the two societies, the society in Athens and the society in Sparta. They just had very different interests. So they would fight each other in wars called the Peloponnesian Wars. And just look at this picture. Who do you think won these wars? Yeah, Sparta. But Athens was never completely finished off. Athens was never completely wiped off the map. And so these two city-states just had a unique relationship where sometimes they worked together and sometimes they would fight. We take this brief learning break to show you Mr. Whiskers in honor of Mrs. Camardello's fourth grade class in New York. You know, because who doesn't like Mr. Whiskers, right? Who doesn't like Mr. Whiskers? What, you were expecting me to use the special Mr. Whiskers voice? Well, Mr. Whiskers is sleeping, okay? I'm not going to just talk that way for you, you know? Um, but if he was awake, you know... The classical period of ancient Greece ended with the death of the most famous leader of ancient Greece, whose name was Alexander the Great. He spent much of his childhood in Athens and was trained by the famous philosopher Aristotle. After uniting most of Greece, he stretched the Greek Empire all the way to India to the east and Egypt to the west. Want to know something cool? He never lost one battle. Never lost one battle. Wow. Even though Alexander the Great was a Macedonian prince, he did grow up in Greece and he loved Greek culture and spread the Greek culture around the ancient world. When Alexander the Great died, it started a period of ancient Greece called the Hellenistic period, the final period of ancient Greece. This final period of ancient Greece ended in 146 BC when Rome conquered Greece and made Greece a Roman province. Even if you don't realize it, day by day, things that we do were impacted by ancient Greece. The way we do math and literature, when we study science and philosophy, our forms of government, that's all impacted by this ancient civilization from the Mediterranean. Cool! Now we are going to learn about an important figure in American history. It's this guy. His name was George Washington. George Washington was a military general and led the American colonists to victory in the American Revolution. He was a founding father of the United States, meaning he was one of the people who started the United States of America. And he served as the first president of the United States, the very first president of the United States. Let's look at his life to see how George Washington helped start the United States of America. It starts in 1732. Wow, that was a long time ago. George Washington was born in the colony of Virginia in 1732. Now, when George Washington was born, the colony of Virginia was part of Great Britain. In fact, all of the American colonies were part of Great Britain. 
This is what the British flag looked like during George Washington's lifetime. It looked pretty similar to what it looks like today. The colony of Virginia, the place where George Washington grew up, belonged to Great Britain. Now, a lot of people have wondered what George Washington was like as a kid, right? But George Washington didn't share many details about his childhood. There is a popular legend about George Washington when he was six years old. It's an interesting one. The legend says that George Washington received an axe for his birthday and used it on one of his dad's cherry trees. Uh oh! <laughs> That's a weird gift to get for your sixth birthday. When his dad found out that his cherry tree was damaged by young George, George was brave and told his dad the truth, saying, I cannot tell a lie. This legend is one of the most famous legends in American history. The legend was written by this guy, a man named Parson Weems. That's an interesting name. He was the first person to write a biography on George Washington after he died. Most historians believe this story was made up by Parson Weems. Even though it was made up, it is a legend that many people think of when they think of George Washington. One thing we know for sure about George's childhood is that his dad died when George was just 11 years old. After his dad died, George spent some time living with his half-brother named Lawrence at a place called Mount Vernon, the plantation owned by Lawrence. Living with his half-brother Lawrence, George was able to learn how to survey land. To survey land is to figure out the distance between different parts of a piece of land, usually to figure out how big a piece of land is. Someone who surveys land is called a land surveyor. In order to be a land surveyor, you have to know a lot of math. George Washington had to use his math skills to survey land. As he got older, people paid him to survey their land, and he had to use math skills every time he did it. This is pretty cool. Here is a picture of a land survey done by George Washington himself. Oh my goodness, he had fancy handwriting. This is so sad. He may have continued working as a surveyor if it weren't for another tragedy in his life. Nine years after his dad died, George's half-brother Lawrence got sick and died too. George was 20 years old when Lawrence died. Two years later, when George was just 22 years old, he became the full owner of Mount Vernon. Now, we didn't mention this earlier, but Lawrence had been a military general for the British in the Virginia militia. Remember, the colony of Virginia, like the other American colonies, belonged to Great Britain. George decided to follow in his footsteps and became a major in the Virginia militia. This was a big deal, especially for someone as young as George was. And it didn't take long for George Washington to be put to the test. The governor of Virginia sent George Washington on a special mission to tell the French to leave an area called the Ohio Valley. They didn't like that, and they made it clear they would not leave the Ohio Valley. And one year later, George Washington led hundreds of soldiers in an event that would start the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War made George Washington famous. He wrote about his experiences and became well known, not just in the colonies, but also across the Atlantic Ocean in Great Britain. 
The French and Indian War not only made George Washington famous, but it also gave him military experience that he would later need during the American Revolution. After the war, George was not offered a placement in the regular British Army, which must have been so frustrating after all he did, and he returned to his plantation, remember, called Mount Vernon. He got married to a lady named Martha and started a family at Mount Vernon. So he settled down and that might have been the end of his story, but he also got involved in politics, which would put him at the right place at the right time. After years of being a politician in Virginia, in 1774, George Washington was chosen to be a delegate of Virginia in the First Continental Congress. A delegate is someone who is sent to represent other people. Virginia trusted George Washington to represent their interests. It was really cool. George Washington was frustrated with how the colonies were being treated by Great Britain, just like so many other colonists. Many of their rights were taken away by laws called the Intolerable Acts. Colonists called them the Intolerable Acts because they weren't able to take it. They were intolerable. Well, in 1775, the American Revolutionary War began and the Second Continental Congress decided to set up their own army called the Continental Army. They selected George Washington as the commander of the Continental Army. It made sense. He not only had a lot of experience as a general in the French and Indian War, but he also wanted the American colonies to be independent and free from Great Britain. George Washington accepted the position, but he refused to get paid to serve as commander of the Continental Army. That's right. He wanted to volunteer and serve without any cost to the American colonies. What a nice guy. So he got to work. George Washington trained and prepared the Continental Army for battle. He wanted to make sure they were ready and helped them become a better, stronger army. And here was his job, if you will. George Washington helped come up with battle plans, led the Continental Army in many battles, and helped the Continental Army run like a well-organized unit. And he was a great commander. Part of what made him a great commander was he was not afraid to take risks. For example, in one of the most famous moments in the Revolutionary War, George Washington led troops across the Delaware River to do a surprise attack on December 25th in 1776. That was Christmas night! Oh my goodness! Even though the water was icy and dangerous, George Washington knew it would be a great surprise attack. Everyone was like, George, too much ice! Too much ice, man! But they pressed on, and it was a big victory for the Continental Army. George Washington eventually led the Continental Army to victory. With help from the French, the Americans defeated the British. After winning the Revolutionary War, the American colonies began setting up their brand new government. And really to no one's surprise, George Washington was picked to lead the Constitutional Convention that established order in the new government. And of course, because he was presiding over everything, George Washington signed the Constitution. Then, when it came time to elect officials, the American people decided there was no better man to serve as the very first president of the United States than George Washington himself. He was elected president in the first national election. 
in 1789, after he was sworn in as President of the United States, he went to live in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the temporary capital of the United States. This is a picture of the house he lived in while he was president. Now, of course, this was before the White House was built. This is the house in Philadelphia that George Washington lived in. Before we keep talking about George Washington as president, we have a random fun fact about George Washington for you. Did you know that George Washington didn't wear a wig? That's right. That was always his own hair. <laughs> he grew it long and would just pull it back. The reason his hair always looked white was because he powdered his hair. He must have thought it looked awesome. So if anyone ever asks you for a cool random fact, let them know that George Washington didn't wear a wig. Guess he didn't need one. It's shocking, isn't it, Mr. Whiskers? It's just crazy he didn't wear a wig. He didn't wear a wig. All right. Well, back to George Washington as president. As we mentioned earlier, he was living in Philadelphia, which was the temporary capital of the United States, which is interesting. And as you might imagine, as neat as being the first president sounds, it was really difficult and challenging. There were many issues that needed fixing, you know, being a brand new nation and all. But George Washington worked hard to give the United States a strong start. In the second national election, George Washington was elected president for the second time. He refused to run a third time and started the tradition by most presidents of serving no more than two terms. Can you spot President George Washington in this picture? Uh huh. Yeah, he's right there, right there. Yep. Mm hmm. Not only did George Washington help the American colonies win their independence and become a new nation, but George Washington also served as the first president of the United States. That is why George Washington is often called the father of his country. Sadly, George Washington wasn't able to see much of what America would become. He became sick and died in 1799 at Mount Vernon. George Washington made a huge impact, and he is celebrated and honored all around us. The capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., was named after George Washington. The Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. was built to honor the memory of George Washington, the father of the United States. We see George Washington honored on our money like the dollar bill. Dollar bills are super cool and George Washington is on all of them. He is also on the quarter. George Washington is on the front of every single quarter, even the state quarters. And of course, George Washington is on Mount Rushmore. It's the amazing sculpture that was carved right into the granite of a mountain in South Dakota. Wow, he is featured on many other sculptures, but this is the biggest and most famous. What a life George Washington lived. Here are just a couple of his accomplishments. He was a general in the French and Indian War. He was the commander of the Continental Army. And he was the first president of the United States. Next, we are going to learn about another important figure in history named Abraham Lincoln. He is famous for his beard. Back then, a lot of people called beards whiskers, almost like a cat. Look, Mr. Whiskers, you have something in common with Abraham Lincoln. Oh. As fun as his beard was, he isn't just famous for what he looked like, he is famous for what he did. He served as president during some of the most challenging years in American history, saving our union when we were in the midst of war and abolishing slavery. 
Let's look closely at the life of Abraham Lincoln starting from when he was a baby. It was a long time ago. Abraham Lincoln was born way back in 1809. This is a replica of the house where Abraham Lincoln was born. A replica is an exact copy of something. This is a replica of his birthplace so we can have an idea of the small, humble beginnings of this future leader. It was a one-room log cabin in Kentucky. When Abraham Lincoln was seven years old, his family moved to Indiana. His dad was a hard worker, farming and working with wood as a carpenter. His parents taught their children about living a moral life and were very religious. They taught their children what was right and wrong on many issues, including slavery. Abraham Lincoln was taught how wrong slavery was, a belief he held throughout his life. Slavery was a terrible system that treated people like property. A slave had no rights and was forced to do whatever their owner told them to. Slavery is wrong, and it was wrong back then. There were many people who wanted to end it because they knew that every person should have rights. Now, as a young man, Abraham Lincoln was passionate about reading and writing. Here is a statue of young Abraham Lincoln found in Chicago. His neighbors used to think he was lazy because he preferred sitting down and enjoying books instead of going outside to do hard labor. He taught himself most things. While he would occasionally have teachers, it was never for very long. He loved reading and learning and wasn't afraid to teach himself. Later, when Abraham Lincoln was 22 years old, he struck out on his own, moving to New Salem in Illinois. It was from there that he once took goods by boat to New Orleans, where he saw slavery firsthand. He remembered what his parents taught him about slavery. No one could have guessed that he would be the person to abolish it. When he returned, he got busy. At the age of 23, he bought and ran a general store for a while, then shortly after served as a captain during the Black Hawk War and ran for political office for the very first time, losing an election. After losing the election, he became a lawyer, studying law all on his own. Remember, he loved learning and reading. Even though he lost his first election, he didn't want to give up. He ran again for office, but this time he won and served four terms in the Illinois House of Representatives. He was only 25 years old. It was during this time serving in the Illinois House of Representatives that he met Mary Todd, and they married in 1842, when Abraham Lincoln was 33 years old. They went on to have four children together. They moved to Springfield, Illinois, where they bought this home. It would be their home for 17 years. It was the only house that Abraham Lincoln ever owned. And here's the cool thing. The cool thing is that you can visit Abraham Lincoln's house in Springfield, Illinois today. You can visit his original house. Wow, that hair though. Woo, somebody get him a comb. <laughs> After serving in the Illinois House of Representatives, he wanted to serve not just Illinois, but the entire United States. So he ran for the United States House of Representatives, but lost. But he was later able to serve a two-year term. He wasn't done. He ran for the U.S. Senate against Stephen Douglas. His debates with Stephen Douglas are considered the best political debates in American history. While Abraham Lincoln did not win the election, the campaign against Douglas made Abraham Lincoln famous and set the stage for his campaign for the presidency of the United States. Notice, Abraham Lincoln didn't quit even after losing so many elections. He is a great example of not giving up. 
Abraham Lincoln finally ran for president, and he won. In 1861, he became the 16th president of the United States. Look, he has the beard! When Abraham Lincoln became president, the United States was divided over many issues, especially slavery. This is sad. Once Abraham Lincoln was elected, the South began the process of splitting away from the United States, which started what became known as the Civil War. The South set up their own country, named the Confederate States of America. While there were many disagreements they had with Abraham Lincoln, they knew that Abraham Lincoln was against slavery. Abraham Lincoln had always been against slavery. He knew it was wrong. This was a major reason in the South for leaving the United States. Abraham Lincoln led the Union through these difficult days. The Civil War began in 1861 and went on for four years. Two years into the war, Abraham Lincoln signed something called the Emancipation Proclamation, which was an executive order that declared all of the slaves free. The powerful words said that all slaves were to be free forever. Here's the thing, Abraham Lincoln never forgot the lessons he learned as a young man. All people are valuable and should be treated with equality and respect. The boy born in Kentucky, who lived in Indiana and then moved to Illinois, just changed American history by abolishing slavery. That same year at Gettysburg, a place where an important battle in the Civil War took place, Abraham Lincoln made one of the most famous speeches in American history, later called the Gettysburg Address. This picture was taken during the Gettysburg Address. Right here is Abraham Lincoln. He opened the speech with these words, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Two years later, the Union won the Civil War, but the joy was short-lived. A man named John Wilkes Booth, angry that the Confederate States of America lost the war, planned to kill Abraham Lincoln. Just days after the Civil War ended, John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln in Ford's Theater. He died shortly after, leaving this country brokenhearted. Abraham Lincoln changed American history, and his legacy lives on today. There is a massive memorial that honors his memory, called the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. His face is featured on Mount Rushmore with other legendary presidents. And of course, his face is on the $5 bill and on the penny. He is all over the place, and for good reason. Abraham Lincoln held America together during the most challenging days in American history when our country was literally at war with each other. He abolished slavery, freeing millions of people, and was killed for standing up for what he believed in. History is fascinating and fun. Be sure and comment below. Let us know what you learned in this video. We hope to hear from you and we appreciate you learning about history with us today. So where are we going next? It's really up to you. Here are two videos you can watch, you know, if you want to keep learning. And if you haven't yet, you can click the circle in the center of the screen to subscribe to our channel. That way you don't miss any of our videos. So what do you want to learn about next?